Welcome to our channel. Did you know that Vito Corleone from the Godfather saga is a fictional character? Yet, not many people realize that he was inspired by real-life New York Mafia bosses from the 1940s and 50s. You can draw some fascinating parallels between Don Corleone and actual mob figures. For instance, Don Vito's discreet lifestyle in the film to avoid the authorities that's a nod to the life of Mafia boss Carlo Gambino, the way he rises to a leadership position at a young age and later instructs his son to avoid his criminal path. That mirrors Joseph Bonanno's story, the olive oil business used to cover up family crimes. It's a reference to Joe Profeci's import business from the 1920s. But perhaps the most striking resemblance is with another Mafia boss. An influential figure with numerous political contacts who, like Don Corleone, strictly forbade his men from engaging in drug trafficking. This mafia boss's life closely mirrors that of the legendary fictional character we all know today. You might have guessed who we're talking about. It's the Prime Minister of the Underworld, Frank Costello. Frank Costello earned this nickname due to his extensive political connections and his preference for maintaining peace within the criminal underworld. Recognized as one of the most respected and influential mobsters in Mafia history, he had numerous politicians in his pocket, which he used to benefit the entire New York underworld. At his peak, Costello was the most formidable political force in New York. In the 1940s and 50s, no one could become a judge high-ranking official, or even the mayor of the city, without Frank's approval. Such was his influence. His guiding principle was to avoid trouble at all costs. While other gangsters engaged in bloody territorial wars, Frank quietly counted his stacks of cash in his luxurious office. In the 1940s, Frank Costello became the new boss of the Luciano family, after his friend Lucky Luciano was deported from the United States. His ingenuity, determination, and sharp business acumen propelled him to the top tire of the Mafia. To reach this dominant position, he went through many challenges, which is why we will delve deeper into this historical figure who remains largely unknown to the general public. From the small independent gangs of New York in the early 20th century, to the golden opportunity of prohibition in the 1920s, his rise in the Cosa Nostra alongside his associate Lucky Luciano and his rivalry with the relentless Vito Genovese, you will learn all about the life of Frank Costello, the real godfather. He was the sixth child of the Castiglia family. For his parents, Luigi and Maria, his birth on January 26, 1891, was an unexpected event but it was still good news, and they had to baptize him. The entire Castiglia family went to the church in their village in the Calabrian region, Loropoli. Luigi and Maria brought their son Eduardo and their four daughters. The villagers wished good fortune to the newborn with cries of Buon Augurio, Del Bamino. Luigi Castiglia, however, was less optimistic. Their family was already very poor and the arrival of a sixth child would not improve their situation. Maria, on the other hand, saw it as a blessing from God. What name do you want to give the child? asked the parish priest. Francesco, they replied. And so Francesco Castiglia's life began. He would later be known as Frank Costello. The Castiglia family, all together, made their way to the church in their village in the Calabrian region of Loropoli. Luigi and Maria brought with them their son Eduardo and their four daughters. Buon augurio del bambino, the villagers exclaimed to wish the newborn good luck. These well wishes were met with some reservation by Luigi Castiglia. The family was already very poor, and the arrival of a sixth child would only worsen their situation. Maria, however, saw it as a blessing from God. What name do you want to give the child? asked the parish priest. Francesco, they replied. Thus, the life of Francesco Castiglia, who would later be known as Frank Costello, began. Around 1893, the Castiglia family had to divide. Don Luigi decided to go to America in hopes of escaping the poverty of the Italian countryside. 
His limited resources meant he could not take the entire family, so he had to leave his wife, two daughters, and son Francesco in Calabria. Convinced he would earn more money in America, Luigi believed the rest of the family would join him soon. But disappointment awaited. In America, he struggled to save money and buy the remaining boat tickets. Life there was as tough as in Calabria. Luigi had merely swapped one form of misery for another. Sell everything, even the sheets, if you must. Even borrow a few lira from someone, but come to America, he told his wife. Two years later, after much effort, the final tickets were purchased. The rest of the family could finally join Luigi in the United States. In 1895, Francesco Castiglia set off for the New World. He would later recall, We were three, my mother, my sister, and me. For luggage, we only brought my mother's huge cast-iron pot from Italy, which she loved to use for cooking. We turned the pot into a cradle, placing a blanket inside, and that's where I slept throughout the entire journey. In America, the Castiglia family settled in a modest apartment in the Italian ghetto of East Harlem, New York. They didn't feel too out of place, as the lively neighborhood was mostly populated by Calabrians. Everyone spoke Italian, except perhaps the local police officer who was usually Irish. To support his family, Luigi Castiglia opened a grocery store on 108th Street. However, the business earned barely enough to cover rent and food despite help from Maria and the children. The children, who were growing quickly, were never satisfied with what they had to eat. Life was hard. At dinner, Francesco would always compare the contents of his plate with his siblings to ensure he got his fair share. When we emigrated from Italy, the only possession we brought was my mother's beloved cast iron pot, which she used for cooking. We transformed the pot into a cradle by placing a blanket inside and that's where I slept throughout the entire journey. In America, the Castiglia family settled in a modest apartment in the Italian ghetto of East Harlem, New York. They didn't feel too out of place, as the lively neighborhood was mostly populated by Calabrians. Everyone spoke Italian, except perhaps the local police officer who was usually Irish. To support his family, Luigi Castiglia opened a grocery store on 108th Street. However, the business earned barely enough to cover rent and food, despite help from Maria and the children. The children, who were growing quickly, were never satisfied with what they had to eat. Life was hard. At dinner, Francesco would always compare the contents of his plate with his siblings to ensure he got his fair share. A friend once shared, when you dined regularly with Frank, you quickly learned never to touch anything on his plate. Sharing food as friends do was to Frank an unforgivable sin. If anyone dared to take from his plate, he would push it aside and refuse to eat. You could see the fury in his eyes. He would immediately call the waiter and order two extra portions, one for the offender and another for himself. It wasn't a fear of germs. He simply detested anyone eating from his plate. This likely stemmed from his impoverished childhood, where he instinctively protected his food from others. At the age of nine, Francesco began attending school. This period marks the first time Frank Castiglia's name appeared in its English form. A report indicating that Frank Castiglia had entered primary school in 1909. For young Frank, learning English was a challenge. Generally, school did not seem to be his calling. He hated attending classes and preferred roaming the streets. Outside, he could at least earn a bit of money. His older brother Eduardo taught him how to improve his lifestyle by stealing fruits from local vendors. This slowly but surely set Frank on the path of delinquency. His parents were not pleased at all. Go to school, Francesco. But I do go, Papa. I go every day. I don't like your friends, Francesco. They are thugs and won't amount to anything good in life. I will become someone, Mama. And I can tell you, that I won't rot away in a grocery store. Be quiet. You must respect your father, do you hear me? You owe him respect. Yes, Mama. Frank would harbor resentment and disdain for his father throughout his life. He saw him as too soft, too humble, 
and too content with his lot. Frank simply couldn't understand why his father had accepted such a poor and mediocre life. Frank permanently left school at the age of 13. From then on, he fully immersed himself in petty crime in his neighborhood. The streets became Frank's school of crime. This informal education, in the early 20th century, would produce some of the most notorious gangsters in U.S. History Frank was on the brink of joining their ranks. Before the 1920s in New York, gangsters rarely mixed with those outside their ethnic groups. The Irish, the Jews with the Irish, the Jews with the Jews, and the Italians with the Italians. The Irish controlled the West Side, while the Italians and Jews held sway over the East Side. In East Harlem, where Frank Castiglia lived, the area was dominated by a Sicilian mafia boss named Ignazio Lupo during the early 1900s. Known as Lupo the Wolf, he managed to gain control over the city by merging his organization with the Giuseppe Moro family. The Sicilian Cosa Nostra, to which he belonged, clearly dominated New York's underworld at this time. Other organizations like the Neapolitan Camorra and the Calabrian Andrangheta also had influence, but it was the Sicilians who ruled the underground world. Originally, the Mafia was a secret society created by Sicilians for Sicilians, aiming to protect their people from numerous invaders throughout history, eventually becoming a state within a state within a state. However, once imported to the United States, Mafia leaders forgot the essence of their organization and began extorting their fellow Italians more than anyone else. Ignazio Lupo was one of these racketeers. His men would knock on merchants' doors, demanding a tax in exchange for protection. If the merchants refused, they would be mercilessly beaten. If that wasn't enough, their shops would be burned down. Reporting this to the local police was a death sentence. Before harm was done, the Mafia would usually send a warning letter marked with a black hand, a sinister emblem that terrified anyone who received it. These extortionist gangs, known as the Black Hand, were not as organized as the modern Mafia that emerged in the 1930s. They lacked a formal code of conduct and true hierarchy. However, they did strictly adhere to one rule, the Law of Silence, known as Omerta. Frank Castiglia continued his education in the streets of East Harlem, understanding well the unwritten rules of his neighborhood. He knew that informers were despised and that talking to the police could lead to being ostracized, or worse, signing one's own death warrant. Frank adhered to this code strictly, never betraying anyone, not even his enemies. In 1910, when Mafia bosses Ignazio Lupo and Giuseppe Morello were imprisoned for counterfeiting, a new crime boss took over. This time, it was not a Sicilian, but a Neapolitan affiliated with the Camorra, Giosu Gallucci. With the decline of the Morello family's influence, Gallucci rose to power in East Harlem. Known for his business acumen, Gallucci amassed wealth through extortion, illegal lotteries, and his political connections, which gave him near immunity from law enforcement. Frank might have taken inspiration from Gallucci's methods, seeing the path he himself would later follow in organized crime. However, Gallucci's reign ended abruptly on the night of May 17, 1915, when five rival gangsters killed him and his son in a cafe. Even with powerful friends, a crime ball could be taken down, a lesson Frank surely noted. One day, Don Luigi Castiglia asked his son, why don't you go to work? After hearing from neighbors that Frank had been loitering all day, surprisingly, Frank heeded his father's advice and found a job with a piano delivery service. But it lasted less than a year. The work was hard and poorly paid, so Frank chose to face his father's wrath rather than endure long hours for little reward. The allure of the street was too strong, and Frank returned to petty crimes like pickpocketing and burglary, one day, he was caught red-handed by a patrolling policeman. As Frank was being taken to the station, a councilman who recognized him intervened, saying, I'll take care of this little rascal. The officer, not wanting the hassle, handed Frank over to the politician. I just did you a favor, kid. 
Remember this when I need your help, the councilman said. Frank was puzzled, but soon realized the importance of favors and reciprocity, a principle he would later use to build one of the largest influence peddling operations in American organized crime history. It was around this time that Frank Castiglia changed his name to Frank Costello. The exact reason is unclear. It might have been to protect his family or to better integrate into society, as Costello was an Irish surname. Another possible reason comes from the memoirs of Charlie Lucania, better known as Lucky Luciano. According to Luciano, they met in a Times Square cinema. It was a Saturday night, and I went up to the center with some of my guys to see what was happening. We liked going to the movies because the subtitles in silent films helped us learn English. We always sat in the balcony. It was cheaper, and we could throw stuff at the people below and create chaos. That night, the manager threw us out along with another group from the other side of the balcony. One of the guys was a bit older and led a gang called the 104th Street Gang. We got to know each other, and he told me he was from Cosenza, Calabria. His name was Francesco Castiglia, but he would later become famous as Frank Costello. The first time I heard him speak, I had to lean in to understand him because his voice was hoarse, like he had a cold. Many Italian kids spoke like that because their mothers thought having their tonsils and adenoids removed at the first sneeze would give them better chances in life. Often... The doctor wasn't very skilled, and the kid ended up with a permanently sore throat. That's what happened to Frank. Frank Costello and Lucky Luciano would become close friends, sharing ambitions and a willingness to do whatever it took to climb the ranks of the underworld. Along the way, they met two other ambitious gangsters from the east side, Mir Lansky, a shrewd and tough small-statured Jew, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, a handsome but deadly trigger, happy individual. Together, they formed a formidable gang, a partnership Luciano fondly remembered. We were the best team ever. We knew our business better than anyone else on the street. We were like the four horsemen. However, this didn't last even a year. The work was too grueling and poorly paid. So Frank quickly decided he'd rather face his father's anger than toil for 12 hours a day for a pittance. The lure of the streets was too strong, and Frank returned to less than holy activities like pickpocketing and burglary. He spent all his time on these activities until one day he was caught red-handed by a patrolling policeman. Frank was arrested and on his way to the station when a city councilman who recognized him intervened. I'll take care of this little troublemaker, he said. The officer, not wanting the hassle, handed Frank over to the politician. I just did you a favor, kid. Remember this when I need your help, the councilman told him. Frank was puzzled, but soon he understood. He had just learned the importance of doing favors for others. It was like depositing money in a bank which you could withdraw when needed. The bigger the account, the more comfortable you were. This was a lesson Frank would put into practice later as he developed one of the largest influence, peddling operations in the history of American organized crime. It was also around this time that Frank Castiglia changed his name to Frank Costello. The reason for this change isn't entirely clear. He might have wanted to shield his parents from the police, or perhaps he thought an Irish surname like Costello would help him fit into society better. There might be another reason as well. According to the memoirs of Charlie Lucania, better known as Lucky Luciano, an Italian immigrant who, like Frank, was making his way in the streets of the East Side, they met in a Times Square cinema in the early 1920s. Luciano recalled it was a Saturday night, and I went to the center with some of my guys to see what was happening. We liked going to the movies because the subtitles in silent films helped us learn English. We always sat in the balcony. It was cheaper and we could throw stuff at the people, below and create chaos. That night, the manager threw us out, along with another group from the other side of the balcony. One of the guys was a bit older and led a gang called the 104th Street Gang. We got to know each other, and he told me he was from Cosenza, Calabria. 
His name was Francesco Castiglia, but he would later become famous as Frank Costello. The first time I heard him speak, I had to lean in to understand him because his voice was hoarse, like he had a cold. Many Italian kids spoke like that because their mothers thought having their tonsils and adenoids removed at the first knees would give them better chances in life. Often, the doctor wasn't very skilled, and the kid ended up with a permanently sore throat. That's what happened to Frank. However, another version of the story, as told by Lucky Luciano himself, suggests they met a few years earlier. It happened in a Times Square cinema, which I believe was called the Victoria. It was a Saturday night, and I had gone downtown with some of my guys to see what was going on. We liked going to the movies because the subtitles in silent films helped us learn English. We always took seats in the balcony. It was cheaper, and we could throw stuff at people sitting below and create chaos in the theater. That night, the manager threw us out along with another group of guys sitting on the other side of the balcony. One of the guys was a bit older and led a gang called the 104th Street Gang. We got to know each other, and he told me he wasn't from Sicily, but from Cosenza, Calabria. His name was Francesco Castiglia, but he would later become famous as Frank Costello. The first time I heard him talk, I had to lean in to understand him because his voice was very hoarse, like he had a cold. Many Italian kids spoke like that. Their mothers believed that having their tonsils and adenoids removed at the first sign of a sneeze would give them a better chance in life. Often, the doctor wasn't very skilled, and the kid ended up with a permanently sore throat. That's what happened to Frank. Frank Costello and Lucky Luciano would later become very good friends. The two young men had the same ambitions in life. They were both sharp, resourceful, and willing to do whatever it took to make their mark in the underworld. Eventually, they would meet two other equally ambitious gangsters. Two Jews from the East Side, Mayor Lansky, a small, cunning, and tough individual, and Benjamin Siegel, known as Benny or Bugsy, a tall, handsome man whose looks could be deceiving as he was quick on the trigger. The four formed a gang. Luciano reminisced, We were the best team that ever existed. We knew our business better than anyone on the street. We were like the four horsemen of Notre Dame, except we wondered what two Jews would be doing at Notre Dame. To return to the possible reason for the name Costello, Lucky Luciano shared an anecdote about their newly formed group's first heist. We were planning to rob a warehouse by the docks. Benny was supposed to go in first and take out the night guard. While we were setting up the operation, Mayor objected. He said something like, Why do the Jews, Bugsy and I, always have to go in first and take the biggest risks, and then we split? Everything equally. After all, there are two Italians in the gang. Why don't you take the same risks? I asked, What do you mean, two Italians? There's an Italian, an Irishman, and two Jews. Just like in the neighborhood. Lansky looked at me like I was crazy. What are you talking about, an Italian and an Irishman? Where do you see an Irishman? I started to laugh and pointed at Frank. He ain't. He's Irish. You know, Frank Costello. From then on, Costello was called that. I remember that after that, we told this story so many times that many guys started calling Costello the Irishman. And of course, later, when we were deep into politics in New York, it didn't hurt to have a guy with an Irish name like Costello with us. Playing with fire eventually gets you burned. Frank Costello was bound to face justice sooner or later. It was just a matter of time. His first arrest happened on April 25, 1908. On that day, Frank, along with two other young thugs, was apprehended in the Bronx after beating up and robbing a coal vendor. In court, he pleaded not guilty and was released without charges. He got off easily that time. Then, on October 16, 1912, he was arrested again on 108th Street, this time for armed robbery. Frank, accompanied by two accomplices, stole nearly $3,600 in cash and $220 worth of jewelry from a housewife. On the day of the trial, 
He once again pleaded not guilty and miraculously, the case was dismissed. Perhaps he had threatened the plaintiff into dropping the charges. No one knows for sure, but luck was on his side once again. However, his luck ran out on March 2, 1915, just a few months after he had married a pretty brunette named Bobby Geigerman. By then, Frank had made it a habit to never leave home without his revolver. Unfortunately for him, he was caught carrying a concealed weapon that day. When questioned by the authorities, he initially gave the name Frank Severio, a nod to his mother's maiden name, but later claimed his real name was Stello, attempting to throw them off his true identity. Frank soon realized that this time, it wouldn't be so easy to get out of trouble. Pleading not guilty wouldn't lead to a dismissal, and the bail for his temporary release was too high. With no other options, he had to sit in jail awaiting his trial. As time passed, the weight of imprisonment began to take its toll on him. Finally, he decided to plead guilty, albeit reluctantly. And now, Severio, tell us your real name. Stello, he responded. I see that in 1908 the defendant was arrested for theft and assault and was released without charges. I see that he was arrested a second time in 1912 for the same reasons and was again acquitted. On both occasions, he claimed his name was Frank Costello. This time, however, he stated that his real name was Frank Severio. Additionally, several letters were sent to me in his favor, but his reputation remains far from excellent. In fact, it is quite bad. According to some neighbors, the accused has a reputation for being a bandit. Indeed, he certainly behaved like one in this case. Your Honor, will you give me another chance? You've had chances over the past six years, and they must end someday. I plead guilty, Your Honor, because I have been in jail for a month, and my family responsibilities require me to avoid trouble as much as possible. That said, the revolver was not found on me, but 100 meters from where I was. That's true but you forget to mention that the officers following you saw you throw it. In other words, your behavior was that of a guilty individual in every respect. I sentence you to one year in prison, whereas the law stipulates that the offense you committed should result in seven years of imprisonment. Frank served 11 months out of the 12 due to good behavior. Released in April 1916, he returned to the streets of East Harlem. During his time in prison, he had thought deeply about his future. He was determined never to return to jail. Running around with a firearm, facing the prospect of more prison time or worse, losing his life, was not part of his plans. That's when I realized I was being stupid. Carrying a gun was like wearing a sign that said, I am dangerous. I am a criminal. Take me off the street. I decided never to carry a weapon again and have stayed true. To that decision. Clearly, Costello needed to break away from petty crime. What Frank Costello needed were serious business opportunities, whether legitimate or not. At this point, an incredible opportunity arose that could change his criminal career forever, prohibition. On January 16, 1920, at midnight, the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, ratified a year earlier, came into effect it was now illegal to manufacture, transport, import, export, import, export, or sell alcoholic beverages. Prohibition had begun. A new era was starting in America, one of widespread lawlessness and spectacular chaos. These years of prohibition would become a goldmine for numerous gangsters seeking prosperity, including Frank Costello and his associates, who were determined to seize this enormous opportunity. As Prohibition began, Costello, Luciano, Lansky, and Siegel were set on establishing a dominant position in this new market. Ambitious as they were, what they lacked at that time was experience. The four were barely adults and knew it would be challenging to compete with the established Italian mafia bosses in New York, who held most of the power in the early 1920s. Among these big shots were Joe Masseria and Cairo Terranova, old-school Sicilians who were highly suspicious of anyone who wasn't Italian, especially non-Sicilians. 
This viewpoint was in stark contrast to the new generation of gangsters like Costello, Luciano, and Lansky, who saw racketeering as a purely commercial venture where ethnicity wasn't a prerequisite for doing business. Their philosophy was to collaborate rather than kill each other. And there was no time to waste. Americans were thirsty, and prohibition was the perfect opportunity to quench that thirst. Their entry into the illegal alcohol market began with the help of an equally ambitious young man who had recently joined their gang, Giuseppe Antonio Dotto, better known as Joe Adonis. Joe Adonis was enjoying an ice cream in Little Italy with Charlie Lucky. Luciano, when he made a proposition, Charlie, I know we've never worked together and I don't like asking for favors, but I need $10,000 to buy a shipment of whiskey in Philadelphia. If you lend it to me, I'll give you 50% of the profits. The previous day, Adonis had met Waxy Gordon, a bootlegger from Philadelphia. Waxy had offered him a shipment of guaranteed Scottish whiskey, but Adonis didn't have enough funds to close the deal. That's why he turned to Lucky Luciano, who remembers, I put my hand on Adonis's shoulder and told him to keep his money because he had just found a partner who would finance the entire operation. I called Costello, Lansky, and Siegel, and we met an hour later. Between the four of us, we gathered $35,000 in cash, and early the next morning, Adonis and I set off. Well, Luciano and Adonis met with Waxy Gordon, and the deal was sealed, marking the beginning of a long series of business ventures. Luciano himself recounted their start in the alcohol trade. The profits were infinitely greater than those we could make by targeting innocent victims or their property, and the penalties were infinitely lighter. As for the chances of ever facing those penalties, they were practically non-existent. Protection could be bought at all levels. Ever since we were kids, we knew we could buy people. The only question was who to buy and for how much. After all, examples were all around us. From the uniform cop to the police commissioner, from the local hustler to the most influential politicians. We knew that most of these guys had their hands out. It was Frank Costello who really paved the way for all this influence, peddling and official corruption. He had the poise and class of someone twice his age. And thanks to that Italo, Irish name, he had adopted all doors open for him. This was the moment when we established a private bank. Not a real bank, but something we called our grease bank. It started with $5,000, which we entrusted to Costello to spend in the most effective way possible. When we did our first deal in Philadelphia, we almost hit the jackpot right away. It was as if we started at the top and began climbing from there. Naturally, in all major operations, we had to take care of people who could be useful to us. So we greased the palms of cops and politicians. Thanks to Frank Costello, our gang had a whole network of politicians and police officers on our payroll throughout Manhattan. This allowed us to trade booze with ease, as the demand was enormous. Besides, his activities with Luciano, Lansky, and Siegel, Costello also partnered with one of the biggest bootleggers of the Prohibition era, William Vincent Dwyer, an Irish gangster nicknamed Big Bill. His nickname wasn't due to his physical size, but because of his hefty bank account and significant political influence. Dwyer and Costello teamed up in 1923. At that time, Dwyer was already well-established in the alcohol trafficking scene and received a proposal from Costello that guaranteed complete protection against the increasingly prevalent raider attacks. For a bootlegger, such attacks could result in significant financial losses, which is why William Dwyer accepted Frank's proposal, likely having no other choice but to accept to avoid major troubles. The Costello-Dwyer partnership became one of the most efficient and lucrative collaborations in Prohibition history. Every year, they imported an average of $40 million worth of alcohol. Remarkably, they were the only smugglers during Prohibition to not lose a single truck to theft significant achievement. As the money poured in, Frank began to ascend to a higher echelon of criminal enterprise. Prohibition made him immensely wealthy, 
allowing him to invest in other ventures such as real estate. As a shrewd businessman, he monitored every dollar spent. This success opened the doors to high society, a world in which Frank felt entirely at home. Friendly and naturally trustworthy, he had the demeanor of someone who seemed completely harmless. These qualities allowed him to mingle with anyone without arousing suspicion. Frank Costello leveraged his apparent credibility to expand his influence and network among the elite. He established connections with politicians, judges, journalists, city councilors, and even movie stars. By corrupting these influential figures, he ensured they protected his businesses and those of his associates in the underworld. If you were a bootlegger during Prohibition and had a problem, you went to Frank Costello, and he would solve it in no time. Frank always had a fondness for Jewish people. In his view, they and the Italians shared much in common as newcomers to America. Both communities had lived separately in Manhattan's ghettos, but had faced similar struggles. When it came to partnering with Jews for business, Costello had no issues. He had already teamed up with figures like Lansky and Siegel. In fact, he was on the verge of introducing another Jewish gangster into Luciano's gang, Arthur Flegenheimer, better known as Dutch Schultz, who dominated the illicit alcohol market in the Bronx. However, not everyone welcomed this new addition. One member of the gang, who we haven't mentioned yet, was particularly displeased, Vito Genovese. A Neapolitan gangster recruited into the gang sometime earlier. Genovese was not well, liked by Luciano and Costello. Despite his small stature and lack of popularity, he was known for his ruthlessness and business acumen. One day, Luciano gathered his associates to discuss a potential alliance with Dutch Schultz. Present at the meeting were Costello, Vito Genovese, Lansky, and Siegel. As the discussion began, Frank Costello brought up the topic that had brought them all together. Vito listened, then suddenly erupted in anger. Luciano recalled the scene. What does this mean? Are you trying to burden us with a bunch of Jews? Before Benny or Meye had a chance to respond, Frank almost punched him in the face and then said, very calmly, you better shut up, Don Vuitton, because you're just a damn foreigner, too. From them, that day on, whenever someone wanted to put Vito in his place, they called him Don Vitones, either to his face or behind his back. Vito never forgave Frank for reminding everyone that he wasn't Sicilian and would never truly be part of their inner circle. Vito had the memory of an elephant and the patience of a lizard. For 35 years, he waited for the opportunity to take revenge on Frank. This marked the beginning of the rivalry between Frank Costello and Vito Genovese. During Prohibition, the alcohol trade in New York was dominated by Italians, largely thanks to Costello, who, with his extensive contacts, served as the perfect intermediary between the legitimate world and the underworld. The supreme leader of the Italian gangs at the time was a short, stout Sicilian mobster named Giuseppe Masseria, known as Joe the Boss. Masseria had secured his uncontested position as leader in 1922, after eliminating his main rival outside a cafe. It is said that Lucky Luciano was responsible for the hit that day, with Vito Genovese, one of Masseria's lieutenants, by his side. However, Luciano and Genovese weren't the only ones working for Joe the Boss. Their close Italian associates were also part of the organization, including Frank, who joined the Mafia in the 1920s. As the leader of New York's underworld, Masseria claimed a share of the profits that Costello earned. For Frank, there were no issues with this. He respected the hierarchy and had no ambition to become another Joe the Boss. His influential position in the outside world was more than enough for him. This arrangement was convenient for everyone, especially Masseria, who was relieved not to have a potential rival aiming to take his place. In the early 1920s, Joe Masseria felt secure in his position as the boss of the Sicilian underworld. No one seemed capable of challenging him at that time. However, there was one individual who might be able to do so. Yes, that Sicilian immigrant who had just arrived in New York. 
Salvatore Maranzano entered the scene. A gangster of the old Sicilian school, Maranzano came to America in the 1920s to pursue his version of the American dream. Settling in Brooklyn, he decided to carve out a place for himself in the lucrative alcohol trafficking market. To achieve this, he formed a group of Sicilians who began to compete with the already established bosses, including Joe Masseria, who saw this newcomer as a threat. Maranzano, with his ambition, sought to integrate Luciano's gang into his organization. He recognized that Luciano and his associates were running a very successful bootlegging operation. He wanted to recruit them and set up a meeting at his headquarters in Little Italy. Frank Costello and Lucky Luciano attended the meeting to discuss a potential partnership. This meeting took place before they joined Masseria's organization. As things stand, we're getting in each other's way. We're fighting for the same markets. And unfortunately, our men are sometimes killing each other. It's foolish, and it costs us both too much money and too many valuable men. This needs to stop. Listen, you didn't bring me here to preach about right and wrong, Maranzano. So stop beating around the bush and get to the point, Luciana retorted. I want you to join the great Maranzano family. You would be like my son, my favorite son. I'm willing to be very generous. You will be like my own Bambino. Bambino? Maranzano's tone might have been a bit too patronizing for Luciano's taste. What right did this bastard have to try to replace my old man? Striking a deal was one thing, but playing daddy with me was another. Maranzano then detailed his proposal. Luciano was being considered for the top lieutenant position in Maranzano's organization. This role would grant Luciano control over the entire illegal alcohol market while providing him with complete freedom of movement. While Costello and Luciano's Italian associates were welcome, Jewish members like Lansky and Siegel were excluded. Maranzano presented his proposal in detail, hoping to persuade his guests. Luciano recalled, he paced the room while speaking, and when he finished, he turned to us as if expecting applause, like he had just delivered a speech before the Roman Senate. He always gave me the impression that he saw himself as Caesar and U.S., as is significant. Costello, who had been silent, finally spoke up. You're talking like we're on a Sicilian mountaintop, Maranzano. Let's get realistic. What do you want? Realizing he wouldn't get an immediate response, Maranzano advised them to take their time and discuss the proposal with their associates. However, as history shows, Luciano and his friends eventually sided with Masseria. The year 1929 marked a significant event in organized crime history. The first National Crime Summit held from May 13 to 16. The idea for the conference came from Johnny Torrio, the retired Chicago Mafia boss and mentor to Al Capone. Torrio aimed to create a national crime syndicate, a confederation uniting all American criminal organizations. He envisioned dividing the United States into territories, ensuring each criminal group received its fair share. Racketeering is an industry like any other. In this national crime syndicate, everyone was welcome. Italian-American mobsters, Jewish gangsters, Irish criminals, and even African-American gangsters. The convention aimed to lay the foundation for a more modern mafia, a visionary project that excited Cosello, Luciano, and Lansky, who shared Torrio's vision. They helped organize the conference, choosing Atlantic City as the location. Costello handled the invitations, inviting the elite of American organized crime. Thus, the New York delegation, the largest group at the meeting, arrived in Atlantic City, it included Johnny Torrio, Lucky Luciano, Mayor Lansky, Joe Adonis, Vito Genoves, and Dutch Schultz. The New Jersey faction, which includes Willie Moretti and Longies Wilman, stood out. Then there was Chicago, with all Scarface Capone, Frank Nitti, and Jake Guzik. Philadelphia had its own notable figures like Waxy Gordon, Nick Rosen, and Max Boo Boo Hoff. Of course... We can't forget the delegates from Cleveland, Detroit, Boston, Kansas City, Louisiana, Florida, and the host of the convention, 
the boss of Atlantic City, essentially the biggest names in the underworld, were present. Notably absent, however, were Maranzano and Masseria. Their traditional views, which emphasized working exclusively with Italian gangs, did not align with the modern ideals and principles of Torrio, Luciano, Costello, and Lansky. According to some FBI informants, Frank Costello was the mastermind behind the conference. The meeting had several objectives, one of which was to lay the foundation for the National Crime Syndicate. Another goal was to address the violence plaguing Chicago at the time. This was particularly urgent given that the conference took place just months after the infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where Al Capone orchestrated the killing of seven gangsters in a dispute over the illegal alcohol market. The massacre had drawn significant attention from the media and authorities, which was bad for business. Johnny Torrio was the first to address the issue, stating that all conflicts needed to cease immediately. Costello was then introduced and took over the meeting. We need to organize ourselves like a business, Costello declared. This is what we are, a business. We must put an end to what's happening in Chicago. You're shooting each other in the streets. Innocent people are getting killed and they're starting to complain. If they scream loud enough, the feds will come down on us hard. And you know what that means. We're in a position to make millions simply by giving people what they want. Costello's bold stance likely made Capone feel targeted, given his notorious temper. It took a lot of courage to challenge Capone's actions so directly. Costello then outlined a plan to end the bloodshed, which Torrio announced. We need to settle this right now. If you go back to Chicago after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, O'Banion's men will be at war and tensions will escalate. We think you need a vacation, Al, they told Capone. At first he thought it was a joke, but Costello quickly made it clear that no one was joking. This isn't a joke, Al. We've invested too much for you to mess things up. Make it easy on yourself. Find a way, but we need you to go away until things cool off. Seeing that everyone in the room agreed with Costello and Torrio, Capone realized they were serious. He was angry, but knew he had no choice. He left the meeting and, shortly after, turned himself in to the authorities. He ended up serving ten months in prison for carrying concealed weapons. The Atlantic City Conference had come to an end. This first summit of organized crime had elevated Frank Costello's status to a national level in the criminal world. His main messages during the conference were peace and cooperation, and they were indeed respected. His peers from across the United States witnessed his diplomatic skills in resolving the Chicago conflict. War was now supposed to be a thing of the past. Business was all that mattered. It would have been useful to convey this message to the two major absentees of the conference, Masseria and Maranzano, who were on the verge of igniting a new feud. This upcoming mafia war was impossible to calm due to the intense tensions. Yes, Maranzano and Masseria hated each other too much to avoid the Castellamarese War. By the late 1920s, Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano were the two most powerful mafia bosses in New York. The problem was that they couldn't stand each other, and that didn't bode well. It became increasingly evident that the two bosses would clash for control of the Mafia. It was just a matter of when the war would break out. The Masseria clan was primarily composed of Sicilian, Calabrian, and Neapolitan gangsters. Among them were notable figures such as Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, Willie Moretti, Albert Anastasia, Carlo Gambino, Giuseppe Morello, Gaetano Reina, and Alfred Mineo. On the other side, Maranzano's organization comprised primarily of mafiosos from Castellamare del Golfo, a small Sicilian town near Palermo. Maranzano could count on Joseph Bonanno, Thomas Lachaise, Stefano Magadino, Joseph Profesi, Joe Aiello, Joseph Magliaco, Tommy Gagliano, Vito Bonventre, and Joseph Valacci. Tensions began to rise in 1928 when the factions started hijacking each other's alcohol trucks. 
Initially, these skirmishes were minor, an occasional murder here, a truck attack there. However, the conflict escalated dramatically in February 1930, following the assassination of Gatano Reina. Reina, an ally of Masseria at the time, decided to switch sides to join the Castellamores, which did not sit well with Joe, the boss Masseria. To retaliate, Masseria enlisted his lieutenant, Vito Genovese. On the evening of February 26, 1930, Reina was ambushed as he left his mistress's apartment. Vito Genovese shot him point, blank in the head with a double-barreled shotgun. Reina's death intensified the hostilities between the two factions. The Castella Marez, led by Maranzano, were determined to avenge Reina's murder. The mafiosi involved in the conflict prepared for an all-out war, moving into secret hideouts and always staying armed to fend off enemy attacks. The Castellamorese War, as it came to be known, reached its peak, becoming increasingly violent in the streets of New York. Despite being an ally of Masseria, Frank Costello managed to stay out of the direct conflict without appearing disloyal. Frank Costello played a crucial role in aiding Joe the boss during a critical moment when Joe narrowly escaped death in a shootout. In his haste, Joe dropped his coat which could have led the authorities straight to him. Fortunately, Frank intervened by visiting a Bronx police station a few days later to resolve the issue. He made it clear to the police that no harm should come to Masseria. Although Costello had no issue helping out, he disapproved of the ongoing war, seeing it as a pointless conflict that hindered business. Luciano and Genovese shared his sentiment, believing that the old Don's conflicts needed to end especially as their boss was on the verge of losing the war. Despite their efforts to persuade Masseria to seek peace, Joe was unyielding. With peace off the table, Costello, Luciano, and Genovese saw only one solution, to conspire against Joe the boss and end the war once and for all. They decided to align with the enemy to achieve their goal, Luciano. Costello, Lansky, and their allies had long planned to take control of the underworld, waiting for the right moment to act. The old Dons were blocking the establishment of a modern organized crime structure, like the one discussed at the Atlantic City meeting. We, the younger generation, hated those old mustachioed men and everything they stood for. We were trying to build an organization suited to the modern era while they lived a century in the past. We knew we would eventually eliminate the old ways. It was just a matter of waiting for the right moment. For us, getting rid of Masseria and Maranzano was like a bank demolishing an old building to construct a new one. We were like contractors clearing the land by eliminating those old relics, they recalled. The first step was to eliminate Masseria. Luciano and his associates arranged a secret meeting with Maranzano. They agreed that Luciano and his friends would take care of Masseria, with the assurance that the opposing faction would not launch any purges once Joe the boss was eliminated. Maranzano, like them, claimed he wanted peace. The Castellamorese War had spilled too much blood, and it was imperative to restore order in the streets of New York. The handshake between Lucky Luciano and Salvatore Maranzano that day signified the death warrant from Masseria. On April 15, 1931, at 9 a.m., Lucky Luciano was alone with Masseria in one of the old Don's offices. Joe was sitting in an armchair, listening to what Luciano had to say. Luciano laid out an elaborate plan to assassinate an impressive array of Maranzano's lieutenants, which would give Masseria a total victory. I had been talking for a good two hours, and old Joe was laughing and licking his lips as if he had tasted Maranzano's blood from a golden cup. Noon arrived, and Luciano suggested to Joe the boss that they celebrate the imminent victory by having lunch at a restaurant in Conce Island. I saw Masseria's eyes light up the moment I mentioned gourmet food. When I reserved a table over the phone, I ordered enough food to feed an elephant, and saliva was literally dripping from his mouth. 
They arrived at the restaurant and ordered their meals, Masseria more than lucky, as it took Joe the boss nearly three hours to finish his meal. Around 3.30 p.m., Luciano proposed that Masseria relax by playing a game of cards. Masseria agreed. They played one round, and at the start of the second, Lucky got up and excused himself to go to the restroom. However, as soon as the restroom door closed behind him, a group of armed men burst into the restaurant. It was the end for Joe. His death marked the end of the war, a war that had elected his great rival Salvatore Maranzano as the victor. Maranzano wasted no time in satisfying his thirst for power by organizing a meeting to crown himself Capo di Tutti Capi, which means the boss of all bosses in the Mafia. All the top New York mobsters gathered to witness what was supposed to make Maranzano the supreme leader of the Mafia. From this meeting emerged the creation of the Five Families of New York, a reorganization of the Mafia hierarchy, making Maranzano the boss of all bosses. However, this coronation did not sit well with Luciano, Costello, and others. They had no intention of letting him take control. Realizing they were not safe with Maranzano in power, Luciano, Costello, and their associates decided to plot against the new king. With support from many other mafia leaders, their plan began to take shape. Maranzano quickly sensed the conspiracy. Determined to act first, he drew up a list of 60 people to eliminate and presented it to one of his most loyal lieutenants, Joseph Valacci, saying, we need to go to the mattresses and get rid of these people. The list included Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonise, Joe Adonis, Vincent Mangano, Dutch Schultz, and Al Capone, who had supported Masseria by contributing significantly to the war chest from Chicago. But Maranzano was not the only one making a hit list. Luciano and his allies had their own, which included all the old-school mafiosi, with Salvatore Maranzano at the top. On September 10, 1931, just before 2 p.m., four men sent by Luciano's gang and disguised as federal agents entered Maranzano's office. Hearing a commotion, Maranzano stepped out to investigate and found himself facing a group of threatening armed men. He tried to retreat to his office, but it was too late. The thick federal agent stabbed and shot him four times. The new mafia guard, which included Frank Costello and his associates, had finally succeeded in eliminating the old dons. They could now organize crime as they saw fit marking the beginning of a new era of renewal and modernization within the Mafia. This extremely prosperous era saw Frank Costello play a crucial role. The story was just beginning. Don't miss the second and final part of this documentary. We will delve into Frank Costello's rise to the top of organized crime, his various run-ins with the law, and his fierce rivalry with the ruthless Vito Genovese. To stay informed about the release of the second episode, subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell. Thank you for watching the first part of my documentary on Frank Costello. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching the first part of our documentary on Frank Costello. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like and share the video with your friends. In the meantime, take care and stay tuned for the next episode. See you soon.